Hi everyone, my name is Jane, and today I want to talk to you about a profound mystery, namely, how ants find your picnic blanket. When you think about it, it should actually be kind of amazing that they can do this. After all, nobody told them that you were there or that you have food. Now, it's no secret that ants are among the most sophisticated species on the planet, and hands down the most successful in evolutionary terms, but not individually. Individually, ants are really unsophisticated. Even a hundred ants are unsophisticated. If you put a hundred ants on a flat surface, they'll pretty much just walk around in circles until they die of exhaustion. But if you put half a million ants together, they'll form themselves into a superorganism with a collective intelligence that far exceeds the intelligence of any individual ant. And so even though each individual ant is basically blind and only very minimally intelligent, together they're able to form an efficient path from their nest to your picnic blanket in a manner of minutes. Now this presents a major question in the study of the emergence of complex systems, which is what I've studied here at Gallatin. How could evolution have produced agents with such a stark contrast between their individual simplicity and their collective complexity? So the mystery that I'm going to talk to you about today is how simple agents interacting via simple rules can and do self-organize into collective, sophisticated behavior to solve system-wide problems, like finding food or building a nest. Problems that no single one of them could solve on their own, and that they solve together without any one of them having any idea that they're doing so. So one of my favorite examples of this is how humans built the internet kind of without really realizing it, and how Google realized it and then found a way to use it. Uh, so in the early days of the internet, users were doing two basic things. They were creating web pages, and they were linking to other web pages. And they started doing this really on their own. And the main criticism was that while there were a lot of good web pages out there with a lot of good information, it was really hard to find anything if you didn't already know where it was. And so Google's major insight was that it could use the bottom-up linking behavior that, that was already happening to rank web pages. So when you searched for something on Google, whatever page on that topic had the most other pages linking to it showed up as the top result. So no one at Google decides what the top result is going to be any more than any individual user gets to decide what the top result is going to be. Yet, collectively, all users do decide what the top result is going to be. Now, as the internet has matured, Google's algorithm has started to take more things into account. Uh, things like an individual user's GPS data or their past search histories. And so what shows up as the top result for any individual becomes a more complex problem. And Google also did more than just uncover these networks of connections. It also started to really influence how those connections grew and changed. So when a page shows up as the top result on Google, the more likely other pages are to link to it. And so this really interesting dynamic emerges between the bottom-up linking behavior and the top-down ranking behavior. So we see an interplay like this in, in the top-down and the bottom-up in the human brain, too. There are something like 10 trillion neurons in the average human brain. And somehow, the individual firing and not firing of all 10 trillion neurons, from this emerges the collective patterns of brain activity that are our thoughts and concepts and ideas. And these patterns, in turn, influence the firing of individual neurons. So as sensory information is processed from the bottom up, higher level brain areas look at the distributed patterns of activity at the lower levels and try to match those patterns to high-level concepts that have emerged from similar patterns in the past. So higher-level brain areas effectively feed these predictions or hypotheses back to the lower levels and influence the firing of individual neurons, not at all unlike the top search result on Google influencing the individual linking behavior at the bottom. So one of the things I was really interested in looking at in my senior research project is how do we do this with computers? One of the main goals of artificial intelligence research is to give computers high-level concepts that they can use effectively in image processing and recognition. So what I did was to see if I could give a computer the high-level concept pigeon. 
because pigeons are my favorite animals. Now, a recent wave in computer science research suggests that teaching or telling computers what high-level concepts are might not be the best way to go about doing it. What if instead we give them the tools to learn high-level concepts themselves? Intuitively, this makes more sense because we don't think about learning and intelligence as just the having of facts and the following of rules. We think about intelligence and learning largely as the ability to think abstractly and to make analogies and problem solve and reason about new situations. Since the brain is an obvious example of a system that does this already, and since those capabilities emerge from the simple behavior of relatively simple neurons, researchers have started building programs that are literally called artificial neural networks. They're networks of individual interconnected simple units that compute simple functions on data. So these programs use the distributed parallel processing of these simple units to find complex features in data. So instead of designing a feature detector algorithm and trying to teach the computer when and how to use it, which takes a lot of time and isn't always an option, these networks of individual units are effectively set loose on data to find the relevant features themselves. And in so doing, they really build and learn to use their own high-level concepts that are related to and that involve these features. And so like an ant finding your picnic blanket without knowing that you're there and that you have food, and like your brain recognizing some percept without your neurons knowing what you're looking at, artificial neural networks are able to recognize their own high-level concepts in data without the individual units even knowing what they're looking for. And so this is important because problems are going to arise that involve concepts that we humans don't or can't know beforehand that might have solutions that, that could be totally counterintuitive to our human brains. So incorporating frameworks for emergent collective intelligence will help us build better machine learning programs. And these programs will be powerful not only in, in image processing and recognition, but in things like medicine and robotics. So I can imagine using a machine learning program to detect and perhaps even develop treatments for unknown medical conditions. And I can imagine building algorithms for autonomous robots to search disaster sites for victims. Understanding how collective intelligence emerges from simple agents in nature has led to major advances in artificial intelligence research. But what can it tell us about humans? Could we start to think about economics and politics and cities and neighborhoods as collective behavior that we all contribute to and engage in. Most social science study focuses on how top-down power dynamics influence our behavior. They talk about how market prices influence our individual buying and selling habits, how policies guide our behavior, how the job opportunities or the feel of a city or a neighborhood make us want to move there. But what about our role in that? Can we start thinking about these phenomena as bottom-up? So can we start thinking about how our individual buying and selling habits set market prices? How our votes shape public policy? How you know, my moving to Alphabet City contributes to the personality of that neighborhood? These are phenomena that we engage in and contribute to every single day. And in understanding how we help shape them, we're that much closer to understanding how they, in turn, shape us. Thank you.